Amen. And uh, people sometimes develop attitudes that uh, push them away from the church. And I'd be the first one to say if you can't walk with Jesus under my ministry, you need to find someone, some place where you can. Uh, sometimes when folks leave, the attitude goes with them. And uh, I believe the Lord really puts a whole lot of stock in attitude. And tonight I, I want to turn your attention. We'll start out in, in Matthew chapter 7. But I want to... Uh, This isn't my original stuff. Brother, uh, Brother Wright had uh, posted this back in uh, towards the latter part of uh, 2020. And he starts out by saying, I came across this word from God in my notes while studying this morning and I felt directed to post it today. It is a long post. Only those who are truly hungry for God will bother, bother to read it in its entirety. Only those who want God more than anything else in this world will respond in the Spirit and seek Him because of this post. Only you and Him will ever know where you fall in this description. It was written as given to me and sent out by email in December, but this word is just as needed today as it was then. It was uh, December 9th of the uh, year 2020 uh, that uh, the Lord uh, gave him this uh, instruction. And I'm, uh, I'm convinced that we're seeing the, the complete and total deterioration or destruction of a culture. And quite frankly, it's happening all over the world. Uh, and I was thinking today that when the danger of keeping God out of your life uh, really opens an individual up to anything goes. I mean, we're seeing that. And those of us that, you know, walk by faith, those of us that separate ourselves from the world uh, are shunned upon because of our beliefs in faith, our beliefs in the Lord. And, and some, you know, reject the Word of God. They, they judge the Word of God. Uh, if there's any... When you, when you think, even believers, when you think that the Bible says that the Word of God is quick and powerful, it means it's alive, and it means it has power in it. And it uses the phrasing of, of sharper than any two-edged sword. And uses the term piercing. To think as a believer, to say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but to look at His Word or take His Word as something that's offensive or something that's, that, that's judgmental, you're not a believer if that's how you feel. If a person's hungry, trust me when I say, I've been around long enough where I've I've seen how not to do it, and I've seen how to do it. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And there's times that there's times that an individual will bring the the word of God uh, across the pulpit in a, in an arrogant fashion and uh, self righteous fashion. But the person that's hungry, when the when the Holy Ghost speaks to them and convicts them. You don't rise up in, in, in anger or a, a judgmental attitude. For me, I say, oh my. And it's like, oh me. And if it speaks to me in a certain way, then majority of times is to so I take it to the Lord in prayer. Were you talking to me last night? Were you, is there anything? You know, I start taking inventory. Do I, do I have an attitude that's bad? Do I have... Whatever. Am I doing this? Whatever. And the thing regarding the church today, the characterization has become this self-justification. We see the spirit in the world. You cannot disagree with anybody. 
you might find somebody that you kind of agree on certain things and 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 you know but they're few and far between and and as, as he writes here the self-justification for this current culture's rejection and refusal to hear truth and or anything that disagrees with their opinions their preferences their choices etc specifically their wills that's really what it's all about it's about people feeling that their will is being attacked you can't tell me this you can't tell me that or or I don't believe this or I don't believe that you know it, it's your you're invading their their area of thinking but the sad commentary is is you don't have a will you, you can't have an opinion you know you can't have your own way of thinking and that spirit is so rampant in our culture today but Jesus plainly declare that we know ourselves and one another for what we really are by what? By the fruit of our lives and the choices that we make. So we'll start in Matthew chapter 7 and the beginning at verse 15. These are the words of Jesus. He said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves you shall know them by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles you see I've, I've been around long enough to know that there are times that people will will come or, or will have conversation with somebody and and they say well I'm in the will of God or I've been in this for however long and uh, and they're, they're projecting this, I have a knowledge of this, I, I've been around for a while, I heard a lot of preaching, uh, whatever. You, by what's coming out of their mouth, you, you, you kind of get the impression that they're telling you that they've got it together and they're a believer and so on and so forth. But then you see their actions. It might be an attitude, it might be uh, certain words that they say, but they're actions that do not line up with the Scripture. And you can't have that. If, if you're truly a child of God, I, I was told something the other day, the Lord is going to tell you one thing and me another thing when it comes to the book and when it comes to our eternal souls. There's going to be a confirmation of the Holy Ghost somewhere in this mix where you know, but you know, but you know that this is the Lord speaking to me. And so Jesus tells us, verse 17, even so every good tree brings forth good fruit but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit a good tree cannot cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down it's cut down and cast into the fire and then he says in verse 20 wherefore because of this by their fruits you shall know them Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now I heard, I heard an individual say, Oh, that's not talking about believers. I believe it's talking about people that are baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and are professing to be believers because they're calling Him Lord. And John said, You can't call Him Lord except except the Spirit of the Lord be, be in you. So they came to Him saying, Lord, Lord. It wasn't some non-believer or new convert or anything like that. Because it goes on to say, verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name? The Spirit was obviously in, in their lives. In, the, in His name they cast out devils. In His name they've done many wonderful works or many miracles. Unbelievers don't do works. Unbelievers don't, you know, prophesy. Unbelievers don't uh, perform, you know, miracles or anything like that. So it's talking about people, friend, that were born again. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 33, Matthew 12, 33, the Scripture goes on to say, either make the tree good, and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt, 
For the tree is known by what? By his fruit. The false prophets are already rising up. We see them in denominal religion. We see them in, in, in you know, the, the main line Christianity. I, I saw a video the other day, I don't know uh, the name of the individual, but uh, you know, long hair, straggly beard, and uh, rocking and rolling for Jesus. Now, I realize that I'm older, and uh, I mean, I... I you know, I, I like soft and gentle music, I, I, but I also like a, something with a beat. You know, it's just we're, 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 we're made in the image of God. He know, He's the one that created us the way we are. But I'm not talking about necessarily the song. I'm talking about the individual singing the song. The scripture says if a man has long hair, it's a shame unto him. It's, oh yeah, now you now you judge. No, no, the book is judging him. The scripture says if a man has long hair, it is a shame to him. And so, you know, to profess, well, I'm a believer and I've got my hair down my shoulders. I'm a male, I got my hair down my shoulders, or in some ponytail, or I got all kinds of tattoos on my arm, of course, if they're saved after the fact. Yes, I understand that. But that's the culture. That's the that's the the. I posted something on, on Facebook. Be careful that you don't fall into the trap of the counterfeit amongst the Christian faith. And there's a lot of counterfeit activity going on out there right now. You know where the the services, everybody's jumping up and down, and then lights are flashing, and there's smoke and all kinds of colors and different things. And again, I guess everything has its right place. But that kind of culture creates this, oh man, I felt so good when I left there. And it's designed to make you feel, you know, it's almost like, the only thing I compare, can compare it to is when I used to go to rock concerts when I was younger. And trust me when I say, I got with it, dancing on the table, jumping around and, and doing my thing. And I left there, I felt high. But you never hear, you need to repent. You never hear, uh, talk, the word doesn't come across of conviction of sin, changing your lifestyle, offering yourself to God as a living sacrifice, submitting yourself to God. And of course, the way our culture is changing right now, you know, from, from things that they're starting to teach in school to, to things that they're trying to make uh, legal. And if you disagree with it, then... Shame on you. So Jesus clearly said to us that the corrupt tree, that corrupt tree has corrupt fruit, and he was talking to the religious of his day. And he says in verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? Think about that statement for a moment. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, it, it eventually it comes out. I've been I've been asking the Lord to manifest the, the gift of discernment so we can discern the spiritual activity. It might be from a person that you run into. Uh, there are people out there that are demon possessed. But when's the last time you saw somebody cast out a devil? Casting out devils is so, so far beyond our way of thinking. But who knows? I believe we're going to see some spiritual activity in that arena come uh, before this is all said and done. I believe with all my heart. There's another, another text in Luke chapter 6, if you want to go with there, me there. In Luke chapter 6 and verse uh, 40. Luke 6 and 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. The word perfect there means to render, that is to fit, uh, sound, complete, 
usually he talks about he, he, uh, uh, either uh, maturing, a matured person, a complete person, um, ethically to strengthen, perfect, complete, make one what he, he ought to be. So everyone that is mature shall be his master. And he says, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye, but perceiveth not the beam that is in your own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou, thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit, for the thorns, for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. You know, when something comes out of my mouth that is not in order, I say not in order, I'm not talking about a swear or, or any of that. It could be an attitude, it could be a, 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 a criticism. Now again, judgment can begin at the house of the Lord. I'm talking about, you know, maybe it's just me, but it's like at the instant I say it, it I feel like a sting, I feel like, Ooh. you know what I'm talking about? It's like, why did I say that? And if there's enough Holy Ghost in you, you'll either say, hey man, I'm sorry I said that. It's like instant. It happens instantly. And I thank God that we have the Holy Ghost to help us with that. Praise God. Jesus has called us all to be fruit inspectors. First of ourselves and our own fruit and only then of the fruit of others. That is, know them that labor among you. There's a scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 12 is what Paul is uh, writing here. He says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So I, I believe if, if, you know, sometimes people might say, Oh, you're being, you know, judgmental. And. You know, something was mentioned to me last night about somebody, and I, and uh, you know, right away, it's. I, I remember my pastor telling me, he says, you know, when you counsel somebody, you might have that one person in the room, and and they're telling you the story, they're telling you what they're dealing with, and you might feel your your blood pressure going up, and you're getting angry, like really, wait, you wait, well, I need to talk that, you know, and you feel yourself getting all excited. He said, be careful because there's. A, always two sides to every story That's right. and then you you counsel with the other person the opposite end of that and you find out their side of the story and it's totally different than what you were told and so I've always tried to live by that that rule and not react on the first story that I've heard you know the, the first you know are you hearing something firsthand or are you hearing something secondhand and sometimes it's even third hand and by the time it gets to you third hand, there's usually something added, something taken away, injected, whatever. So something was said to me, and I, I thought, and I said, well, I said, but who knows? You, know, you always want to try to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Who, who knows uh, the possibilities? Maybe there's been repentance. Maybe there's been change or, uh, or whatever. But as, as he wrote here, we're fruit inspectors, but we're fruit inspectors of ourselves first. And it's almost a two-edged sword because there's a lot of believers that deal with guilt and deal with self-condemnation. That if they, 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 they do something, they say something, or, or something seems to be out, they, they don't look at it as, okay, Jesus showed me this. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I'm glad He doesn't give up on me. They look at it as, at this, oh, no, I'm, I'm not this and I'm not that. And it makes them, it literally paralyzes them. 
So they can't even function as a child of God because immediately the adversary moves on in and just condemns the fire out of them. So, yes, we inspect our fruit, but we don't expect inspect our fruit for condemnation's sake. We inspect our fruit in the Holy Ghost for conviction's sake. And there's a big difference between feeling convicted because you did something wrong or said something wrong and you feel that shame. I thank God. I can't count how many times I said to God, thank you, Lord, that I still have that sensitivity that when I mess up, I can repent of it. I can uh, forgive me, Jesus. And repentance and, and seeking forgiveness should be instantaneously. Where you say, oh man, I messed up, Father. Forgive me, Lord. I thank you for the blood. I, I, I confess it to you. I'm not going to do it anymore. Whatever it, it may be. And you should be able to get up from that moment and be a, as happy as a lark, as full of the Spirit of God, and be able to function as a child of God, not drag it in the rest of your day and drag it into tomorrow. And then you go into prayer and you drag it out some more. No. It's instant, Sister Doty. It's instant. I messed up. Forgive me. Move on. And when you live in that mindset, it totally revolutionizes the way you walk in this world uh, with, your, with, with Jesus because it's a benefit to the child of God. He has given us grace. And John said, if we confess our sin, He's faithful. You think He, he said, oh, let's see. Now, do I want to forgive you or not? Hmm. You know, this is the fifth time you've done this. I really don't know if I should conf- forgive you or not. But no, it doesn't say that. He knows our frame. He knows we're dust. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our frailty. Matter of fact, He knows our weakness better than you know your weakness. Our Father desires that each of us would by His grace alone essentially start every day by first inspecting our own fruit through His Word and by His Spirit. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 with me. 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. What's it say? Examine yourself. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. I'm going to read that in the Passion Translation. Now your souls will be strengthened and healed if you hold fast to your faith. Haven't you already experienced Jesus Christ Himself living in you? If not, you are deficient. You know, the, the, the way some of the translations bring out, you know, bring out the text and bring out the scripture that they're, t- that they're talking about, it, it's incredible to, to look at it in some cases through different uh, translations so that you get uh, maybe a, 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 the Amplified, the Amplified Classic, for example. That's another, you know, good one to, uh, to look at. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you're holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourself. Not Christ. Do you not yourselves realize and know thoroughly by an ever-increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits, disapproved, on trial, and rejected? Those are some powerful words. But the point being is that we examine ourselves. And when you examine yourself and you're before the Lord and you're you're honestly inspecting, you're honestly examining, do you think God's going to play hide and go seek with you at that time? Do you think He's he's just going to ignore your cry or ignore, Lord, is there anything in my life that you're offended with? You know, and Lord, is it, you know, have I sinned? Have I, you know, you know, I pray every day, forgive me. Every single day. I ask Him to forgive me for my iniquity. Because I know, Sister Doty, that throughout yesterday, I did my own thing. And you did too. So I say, forgive me, Jesus, for for, for my iniquity, for me being in control of this or, or that. And uh, even for those secret things I've done that 
didn't realize I was doing them or, or those things I think are okay and they're not okay. Every single day I ask Him that. And I think that's the way Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us for our trespasses. And so when you when that's habitual in your life, then, then there's always a check there. There's always and it comes instantly. If you're used to doing that every single day before God, it's pretty hard to, to, to step, as Brother Wright says, follow your peace. If you're following your peace and man, all right. But as soon as you go to stray and you lose that peace, uh oh. Maybe I said something, maybe I did something, maybe I thought something, maybe whatever. I mean, the Holy Ghost will tell it to you instantly. Instantly. And you can, oh man, Lord, I, why did I say that? Why did I, why did I do that? Our Father desires that each of us would, by His grace alone, essentially start every day by first inspecting our own fruit through His Word and His Spirit. In Psalms 139, another great uh, you know, portion of Scripture, Psalms chapter 139, and verse uh, 23 and 24. Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. Let's read it together. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. What a powerful Scripture. Psalms 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And see, that's, that's where we're at today. The spirit of our culture, the self-righteous, self-will culture that we're living in. Nobody else is searching their own heart. Nobody else is questioning their own motives. They're questioning your motive and my motive and everybody else's motive. We have to think like they think, believe what they believe. And when you stray from that, they get angry about it. Really, who was the one that was up in heaven that wanted to be like the Most High God? It was a spirit of pride. And this culture stinks with the spirit of pride. Ezekiel 18. Old Testament book of Ezekiel chapter 18. And uh, beginning at verse 18. It just never ceases to amaze me when I search the scriptures and the. Don't ever let anybody tell you that there is not an answer in the Bible for any question that could be asked. Because the Bible has an answer for everything that's in it. Even those times where you're, you're going through something, you don't understand why. You feel like you've been faithful to the Lord. You feel like, man, I, 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 I'm, I'm doing everything I know how to do. Why, why is this happening? There's an answer in the Scripture for that. Even if it is, the answer is be still and know that I'm God. There, there's, a, there's an attitude to develop. There's something, there's a scriptural mandate. Something that I can, I can, I can get a hold of. That He's the sure anchor of my soul and... And uh, yes, after I've searched my heart, yes, after I've confessed any known sin, and yes, if I've, after I've repented of any any uh, 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 faults that I might have or my presumptions, or after I've done all that, when I'm in those situations where God is allowing it to happen because He's doing something in me or working something in me or out of me, it's His it's His plan, it's His purpose. I was created by Him. It's, it's either do or die. I should be able to stand on the foundation of His Word and say like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning at verse 18. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet you say, why? Does not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father, when the Son has done that which is lawful and right, and has kept all of my statutes, and has done them? He shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. This world it has a rude awakening coming. When the judgment of God begins to, begins to unfold. And trust me, I thank God for His grace, for His keeping power. Uh, where would I be? Where would we be if it wasn't for the grace of God? And when that judgment starts being poured out upon the earth, I am going to be very, very grateful, and you're going to be very, very grateful that we remain true to Him. There is nothing, I'm convinced there is nothing you and I can face, nothing you and I have to go through that He's not there to give us the sufficient of what we need to make it to the other side. That's in the book. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. God will with the temptation make a way of escape. And sometimes the only way of escape is for you to be still and know that He's God. Rest in His grace. You'll pray more. You'll fast. You'll do whatever you've got to do just to draw near to Him. Verse 21, If the wicked will turn from all their sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. God is desiring that mankind would repent. God is desiring that humanity would, would come to the realization that, man, we have messed up. And call upon the name of the Lord and, and seek His face and seek His forgiveness. That is what God desires every single human being to do. Verse 22, All His transgressions that He has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto Him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. So the next time the devil tries to convict you and beat you about the head and shoulders, letting you, uh, calling you a failure, calling you a loser, calling you a, a non-child, whatever he throws at you to paralyze your thinking into questioning who you are as a child of God, these verses alone should tell you, I am a righteous child of God. Not from my righteousness, but from my identity with His righteousness. Amen. Yes, sir. Praise God. Thank if God doesn't throw it in your face, then why should you believe the devil? That's right. Yet you say, verse 25, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in them for his iniquity that he has done, shall he die? Verse 27. Again, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and does that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considered, everybody say considered, he considers. See, there's people denying their, they have sin. There's people that are living their life thinking that they're a believer, thinking that they're, they're a child of God, thinking that they're part of the church, but their life is not. It doesn't line up with Scripture. There is no Holy Ghost or Spirit leading them. So they never come to the place where they've acknowledged transgression, where they've acknowledged, okay, I, I'm not doing the will of God. Verse 28, because he considers and turns away from all his transgressions that he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. It is equal, God says. I will judge, verse 30, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one, according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourself from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Verse 31, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? 
For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Praise God. Stand with me if you would. In 1 John chapter 3, the epistle of 1 John, the third chapter, in verse 18. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. I believe he had a special relationship with the Lord. And God gave him and used him to write a lot of wisdom, not only in the Gospel of John, but also these epistles. And in 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 18, he says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. you got to ask yourself, do I identify with deed and in truth? This whole world is against us. The spirit of this world is against us. And it's not God's design that we stick our head in the sand and make believe it's going to go away because it's not going to go away. They hated Him. They crucified Him. And the time is going to come where persecution, being a believer, standing for righteousness, standing for holiness, standing for this book is going to be illegal. He says in verse 19, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. God will never ever toss you away or push you away if you approach Him with a contrite. A, how does it say? He dwells with those of a contrite heart. A, a broken spirit. That doesn't mean it blows me or I'm no good. Or, no, it means a, a humbleness that we approach Him in humility and say, Oh, God. How did Paul say it in Romans 7? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? With my mind I serve the law of God. With my flesh the law of sin. He didn't ponder that thought the very next verse. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Being a believer doesn't mean that we're perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up because we're flesh. But he says, and notice what he says in verse 20, if, for if our heart condemns us, what's it say? Say it again. God is greater than our heart. Every time you and I feel the sting of guilt and the sting of shame, it is not coming from God. It's the adversary's way of trying to destroy you and I and try to paralyze us from being the people of God He's called us to be. God will bring conviction to you. He'll bring brokenness to you where you can forgive me, Jesus, for what I've done. You, 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 you're going to feel this sense of guilt, if anything, or, or conviction. Well, you say, oh man, I am so sorry. You, you ever hurt somebody to the degree where you cried? If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and He knows all things. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have what? Confidence. Then have we confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His 
Praise God. Praise God. Would you love Him with me a little bit? Would you thank Him? Before you leave this house and before you leave His presence, thank you, Jesus. My Lord God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your word that you've given to us that guides us through this life, guides us through the valleys, guides us through the challenges, guides us over the mountaintops, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you declared and promised us that you would never leave us, you would never forsake us. Put it in us, Jesus, to seek you with all of our heart, our minds, our, our soul, our, our being, Father. Give us a love for this truth, Lord, so we would not be delusioned, O oh God, by the things that are coming upon the earth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for keeping us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for preserving us during this time. I believe the joy of the Lord is our strength, my God. We receive your joy tonight. We receive your peace tonight that passes all understanding. We don't walk by sight. We walk by our faith in you. We walk by our faith in your ability, Father, to keep us and preserve us by your active spirit that is in us, Lord. In your mighty name, Jesus. I lose joy in this house. Soundness of mind in this house. We cast down the imaginations of our human thinking and reasoning, Father. And we receive Your Word. We receive Your truth. And we thank You for it, Lord. And we praise You for it, Jesus. To You be all the glory, the praise, and the honor. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Praise God. Isn't He an awesome God? He's so good to us. So loving to us. And He's got such a plan and He wants you and I to be a part of that plan. Amen. I say to him, Brother Mike, sometimes, oh, you know, Lord, I just turned 69. I don't know how many more days I got, but whatever I can do, I'll do it. You know, even Brother Mike Andrade, when my bones pop and I feel those muscles strain, whatever I can do, Jesus, just give me something to do. There's people that are in your life, around your life, that need to hear what you have. And if you will engage yourself in that ministry and seeking the Lord and asking God to lead you across people's paths, open doors, Father, for us to speak to somebody, to, to tell them, Father, I believe He will because it's exactly the purpose of why He saved us. In Jesus' name, God bless you in the name of the Lord.